Awesome. Hello, Zyra. Okay, now it says it's gonna it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Hello, uh, welcome to my talk. Um, I have <laughs> been sick. You can almost hear me start. Uh, I might cough and make disgusting sounds, but it should be fine. Um, thanks for coming. I appreciate everybody being here. Um, this is a talk that I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, I think that large snakes are so common in zoo collections and um, there's kind of a varying level of, of comfort when it comes to working with them or knowing what's best for them. And also in the hobby, in the private hobby um, of reptile keepers, you don't always have the best influences. Um, there is a lot of husbandry issues that are practiced by even some very popular um, reptile keepers and YouTube channels and things like that. And so I will touch on that a little bit. Let me <clears throat> share my screen. Let me make sure this is good to go. Please be patient, I apologize. Let's see, boom. So the way that Zoom works, I've noticed, especially if I do a PowerPoint through the system, is that I can't usually see chat, unfortunately. Uh, but if you have questions, then we will answer those at the end. This is, this is 74 slides. <laughs> Uh, but it, I don't want it to take more than an hour start to finish to go through everything. Uh, one thing that I do want to note, um, this will be really safety heavy. Um, and due to time, uh, preparation time, I didn't make a notes document for this. And so I understand from college that you only want a certain number of words per slide that's not we're not doing that here so there's going to be some slides with quite a bit of information on them um and that is just because i didn't have notes set up so this is pretty thorough in that presentation this will be uploaded uh to the new youtube channel and um the slides will be shared also, like always. So don't worry about, I don't know, I always take notes during presentations. Don't let the amount of text stress you out. But welcome. So this is uh, Care and Welfare of Large Constrictors. So about me, um, if you've been to my talks before, you know, I've worked with reptiles for a long time. Um, I've been in the field since I was a teenager. And most of my career, I've worked with large constrictors. So I started out at Serpent Safari, uh, which was a reptile zoo in a mall where I grew up. And we actually had several huge snakes. We were kind of well known for having the world's largest snake on record, which was a Burmese python named Baby. And she was over 400 pounds. As you can imagine, if you know anything about Burmese, uh, she was fat. So she wasn't um, 400 pounds of lean muscle. Uh, she was a pretty big snake. And we also had, at that time, the world's largest green anaconda on record. We had a yellow anaconda as well. And at one point, we had three adult reticulated pythons on exhibit. And so I started out uh, educating and caring for very large snakes. Um, I always kind of like them. I'd always been into crocodilians from the beginning, but as I moved institutions, there was always a large snake involved of one species or another. And at this point, um, I don't own large snakes anymore, but I have owned anacondas. I've kept reticulated pythons at home. I've always, almost always kept Burmese pythons at home. Boas are super common. So all the species that I'm gonna talk about, um, in this presentation besides African rock pythons, which I've only worked with a couple in my life, 
um, I have a lot of experience with um, either privately or professionally. And just to show that, there's my senior photo from high school 15 years ago of a boa from Serpent Safari, actually. So that was the first time the photography studio had ever had a snake brought in. So I just thought that was ridiculous. I was looking for another photo and um, that'll have to do. Let me see if I can close this because I can't see the whole screen. There you go. So you might've noticed the change for anybody that follows my talks. I created a Facebook page about a year ago, um, not, quite sh not quite knowing what I was gonna do with it. And so I'd always wanted to have a passion project about animals that I loved. And through doing these talks, this is my fourth one. Um, I realized that this is what I wanted to do with it. And so all of my events and uh, posts, um, like promotional posts, and a lot of the documents, uh, the documents from previous talks that I did are now gonna be posted to that Facebook group. Um, I don't have a website right now because every website maker is garbage. So I'll get to that at some point, but I wanted these talks to be separate from my day job. So I am a curator, um, but I, it's always kind of a fine line speaking on behalf of an institution. Um, obviously I don't share any content that's like controversial, but I wanted it to be standalone and this is kind of um, what it's come to. And so the logo, which I am going to draw a logo is uh, Komodo Dragon I worked at. With, I worked with at Fort Worth Zoo, his name was Dante. And so I put him as the profile photo when I made it and I haven't changed it and I'm not going to. So there we go. So that'll be the change in name. And then going forward, my events and things like that will be posted on that Facebook page. So contents, there's my beautiful Burmese Python from Fort Worth Zoo. His name was Jim. Um, he, he's still alive, <laughs> but so that's Jim. Um, I will briefly go over the species that will mostly be referred to in this talk. Uh, we'll talk about housing needs and feeding and then kind of judging feeding based on body condition. And then we'll go into safe servicing and handling, which will be a big section because there's a lot to say. I didn't really expect that, but there's a lot to talk about um, because everybody's housing situation is different with large snakes. Then we'll talk about handling smaller specimens for education. And then we'll do welfare indicators and some enrichment uh, at the end. So in this talk, I'll be doing the two most common species of anacondas, uh, reticulated, all the rock pythons, so Burmese, Indian, and African, and then boa constrictors or red-tailed boas, which is a variety of su uh, subspecies and regional uh, variant. So that just covers all of them, not talking about any of them in particular. So these are all really big snakes. Boa constrictors are are large, not all of them are, but I included them because they are super common in zoo collections um, and in education. So green anacondas are huge. Um, they're awesome. Anacondas are some of the coolest snakes. They're uh, not super closely related to other living species. Um, they are a type of boa, but they are distinct from other boa groups. Um, and green anacondas are the largest. Uh, they're also on average the heaviest snake species. With a lot of these snakes, all of them, um, typically females are considerably larger than males. Um, there's usually a difference in adult size between males and females. It can be easy to tell when you're looking at a large snake. If it's giant, it's usually gonna be a lady. Um, but these are mostly water dwelling. They do haul out on land, but water allows them to ambush their prey. So they have kind of high set eyes. They also have a really distinct spotted pattern. And so do the yellows. So yellows are, you can tell between green and yellow, they have a similar face. They have those high eyes that are closer to the front of their snout and they have like a spotted mottled pattern. Um, yellow anacondas are smaller than greens. Um, 
I'm not putting, you'll probably notice I don't put links and weights and all of that. Um, I could do a whole presentation on full size, record size, that type of stuff with these snakes. And a lot of people know that snakes tend to look larger than they are. And it can be really hard to cite length and weight. You know a big snake when you see it. Snakes, small or it's huge. Um, but on the scale um, for large snakes, yellow anacondas are on the smaller side. Again, with the females being larger than the males. Um, green and yellow anacondas are common in the reptile hobby, but usually yellows, you see them a little bit more common, commonly because they're smaller, they're nasty. Um, I've had yellows and they strike harder than any other snake I've worked with. They will knock tools out of your hand and they can strike repeatedly. It's incredible um, how fast they can strike. But uh, because they're smaller, you see these a little bit more. And you also do see hybrids between uh, yellows and greens as well, which are really, can be really strange. Every individual looks different. Reticulated pythons. Um, besides the anacondas, I think in zoo collections that reticulated pythons are some of the more dangerous species to work around. And it's not necessarily a negative um, to say that they're, aggressive, that's just how they are. They have that reputation of, as a species. As they've been captive bred, we've seen more docile temperaments, but um, my entire life, usually when retics are brought up, they're not known for being educational animals. There are always exceptions though to that. Um, but these are huge snakes. They're um, usually the longest snakes on average. Um, adults are usually, adult females especially, can get over 16 feet, which is massive. Um, they have really intense faces. They have the bright eyes. Um, this is a wild type. There's variations of pattern and color depending on what uh, region they come from. And then of course in captivity, they've been bred into an incredible variety of colors um, that you sometimes see on display also. Um, Burmese and Indian pythons are fantastic. Um, I used to work with Indian pythons that were bred uh, at San Diego Zoo that we had when I was at the Wildlife Discovery Center. They were some of the most sociable snakes I had ever seen. Um, I lost a bunch of my photos from early in my career when I worked with a lot of these snakes because I had the crappiest phone and I couldn't really find any high quality pictures, unfortunately. So some of these were cited from the internet just to have visuals. But Indians, which are on the top, it, they have a really pink face. They have a really light tan body. Um, they're gorgeous. They're hard to get in the U.S. Um, the areas where they're native, there's a lot of Facebook groups for Indian python ownership, and they're just stunning, the photos that people share. So you don't see them as often, as often in zoos compared to Burmese pythons. Burms have been in captivity for a very, very long time. They've also been bred into a lot of different colors and patterns. They're naturally more docile. You do get nasty ones, but these have been used for handling and display. Um, and they tend to be pretty trustworthy depending on the snake. And you see the albinos quite often. Um, for quite a while, albino Burmese pythons were almost more common than normal coloration um, because the yellow was so appealing to people. So I love berms. I'm partial to berms because I think that. They're gentle giants. Um, African rocks also have a reputation for being pretty mean. Um, just defensive snakes, they're very, very strong. They have a lighter pattern like Indian pythons do, but uh, or the lighter base, but their patterning looks like berms. So African rocks and all their subspecies are related to Burmese rock pythons and Indian rock pythons. So they have a, a similar appearance. African rocks have kind of a lighter eye. Um, they look to me to be more aggressive. That might not necessarily be the case, um, but these, you see them in zoos, but not quite as much. Um, they're also not quite as easy to get um, in the pet trade either. And then you have boas. So red-tailed boas are awesome. 
You use them a lot in education. They're very inquisitive. Um, they tend to be very docile. They're really pretty. They come in a lot of different uh, color variations. And then of course, through captive breeding, you've gotten um, even more wild colors. Uh, they're really good eaters. They get pretty big in terms of females, females to males, but um, they are pretty good at, uh, they tolerate handling well. And um, you see them often for handling for education. So what do all these snakes have in common? Well, of course, they're all big, big compared to snakes that you would find. Like I live in Illinois. We don't have any snakes that come close to these animals. Um, big snakes are always a big draw for zoo visitors. Um, having a big exhibit in a reptile house featuring a huge snake, even if it's just sitting there, it's usually pretty popular with the public. Um, they require large enclosures. Um, almost all of these species besides boas, boas are very arboreal. Um, even as they get bigger, uh, they spend most of their time off the ground. They're also excellent swimmers, but their body shape um, is kind of the cross section of a boa compared to anacondas and pythons is kind of like loaf of bread. They have like a tall body. Um, and that tall body shape is usually associated with arboreal snakes. They have a lot of lean muscle for climbing, but most of these other snakes, even African rocks, which are sometimes seen as an arid species, they love to use water. So they'll sit in water to cool themselves off, to travel, to hide from predators, to stalk prey. So um, some of these are kind of seen as like stereotypic, like grassland or rainforest species. Um, but a lot of the studies on their wild behavior has shown that a lot of these very dense snakes um, will use water heavily more than you would expect otherwise. Um, but of course, with these big animals, you get issues with weight. Um, if they are overfed or understimulated, you tend to have pretty large individuals. And then obviously their size creates very specific um, requirements for working around them safely. Uh, they're also for being non-venomous. Interactions with them can be life-threatening. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm never gonna like play this up. I don't think that large snakes are too dangerous to have and to house. I just think that most people underestimate them in a different way. Um, which we can talk about when we get to handling. So just quickly, if you don't know anything about snakes insides, all their organs are very long. So you have a long animal, so it's gonna have all long insides. This is what separates them from legless lizards. So anybody that works with legless lizards, um, their organs are like a little longer than a lizard's body and then the rest is tail. People always say snakes are all tail. Their tail is like the very end. Um, so they have all their organs spread out and in large constrictors and a lot of other snakes, but especially in boas and pythons, um, the left lung is super reduced and the right lung takes up over half the body length. So there wasn't enough room for two lungs. Um, air exchange wasn't as efficient as it could be. And so over time that's been reduced, but they have pretty much everything that we have um, except for cloaca. So multi-purpose opening, as my supervisor used to say. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But then, yeah, then you have the tiny, tiny tail. So their skeleton. Uh, this seems like a stupid thing to say, that they have the same number of ribs and um, vertebrae their whole life. But a lot of people don't know that, um, especially when it comes to the public, that they're born with the same number of bones. It sounds so weird to say, but they have the, their complete skeleton when they're born um, and their skeleton grows. So they never get more bones. You'd be surprised what people ask. So I wanted to include it. So most of their body is going to be a uh, spine and ribs. Um, the ribs are pretty flexible and there is a uh, many tiny ligaments that connect skin to muscle, or excuse me, skin to bone, and that helps create their 
control for locomotion. And so a lot of large constrictors locomote, it's called rectilinear, which is the caterpillar movement of their abdomen. They use the scales on their stomach to push off of substrate. And so their ribs and the muscles and the scales all work together to push them forward. And they have a very flexible skull, which allows them to swallow large prey, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with. Large snakes can eat really large prey items. Um, and that flexible skull and jaw allows them to do that. And then boas and pythons have spurs, which are vestigial limbs. Um, they have very reduced hip and leg bones. Um, if you, I don't, it doesn't have it on this skeleton. I should have found a better picture, but at the tail base, they'll have actual claws, which have keratin tissue, just like other animals claws. And those are connected to little leg bones um, and they can rotate their spurs um, and flex them. And on some snakes, most snakes, the males have larger spurs than the females. That's not always the case. Um, that photo that I shared and that's featured here is the huge spurs on the Burmese that we had at Fort Worth. It was the biggest spurs I've ever seen in my life. It's very impressive. He didn't really care about much, so you could show his butt <laughs> and he didn't really mind. So there's these snakes are all different in appearance. Um, and also, even though as large constrictors, boas and pythons are related, there are some differences. So on the left is uh, um, a boa constrictor, the different variation. I'm not an expert in variation. Um, but they have kind of the distinct lipstick markings on the front of their snout, which is super cute in my opinion. They have the stripe that runs through their eye um, and they don't have any heat pits. So they have smooth scales on their face. Um, they might have some heat sensing ability, but it's definitely not as distinct as on the reticulated python on the far right. So pythons have uh, heat pits on the their top jaw and then on the bottom jaw on the sides you can see as well and those pits have uh, skin or really thin membranes inside that detect changes in temperature and that allows them to have a very accurate strike. Um, anacondas in the center very distinct compared to the other two they have um, pretty far forward eyes that are on the top of their head their nostrils are far in the top of their head towards the tip and uh, greens have very distinct uh, black and red eye stripes, depending on the individual with darker eyes. The retic on the right is obviously a type of albino, but retics tend to have pretty striking orange eyes um, and those distinct heat pits. This is an awesome uh, diagram from Lindsay Kernodal on the ligaments and the skull structure that allows snakes to open their mouths so wide. Um, the jaws on snakes, so there's always kind of the discussion of snakes being able to unhinge their jaw. So they don't unhinge them at the corners. Um, the corners of the jaw are incredibly flexible um, and allow them to rotate in different directions. Uh, the Bottom jaw doesn't connect at the front like our chin does, and that's what allows so much of that flexibility um, to the point where it is extreme, um, the uh, extent to which they can open their mouth. They have awesome recurved teeth that help pull the food in. And those teeth, you don't always see them. That's one thing that I've noticed when uh, especially educating on large snakes, is that uh, people, when they yawn, you don't see any teeth. Their teeth sit in uh, gum sheaths. So the anaconda on the top, anacondas have dark uh, mouth interiors, which I always thought was super cool, usually purple or black. And you can see that, sometimes you can see that very tip of the teeth, but it looks like just gums with no teeth in them. And you can see their, the trachea, the windpipe that's open on the bottom. Um, but when you push that sheath down, like the boa on the right there, um, they have long, thin recurved teeth that point towards the back of their mouth. And these are, they're fairly brittle. They do lose their teeth their entire life. 
Um, and that can cause issues if you've been bitten by a, a, a snake. Sometimes your body will push a tooth out like weeks or months later that was embedded in the skin. And that's something to always think about. Um, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. So of course, like other snakes, boas and pythons have a Jacobson's organ, which is a special scent organ and the roof of their mouth that helps them analyze scents. They use their tongue to pick up scent molecules. So they have very, um, very, very sensitive, um, that very, very sensitive scent organ can allow them to pick up really small remnants of scent of other snakes, of predators, of prey. And so this is something that has to be kept in mind for handling um, that you don't handle snakes, or excuse me, well, in anacondas, they will eat other snakes. Anything that they want to eat um, that you've been handling and you have scent on that, they absolutely know. So this is very common um, in zoos to know that you should always wash your hands before you handle a snake. But when it comes to very large snakes, the consequences are a little bit more intense. But just in case no one knew, snakes have excellent, excellent sense of smell. So I think you can see my cursor. I love this photo, but to show the inside of a snake's mouth. And so with large constrictors and another snake species, they have four rows of teeth on top. So there's an outer row, there's an inner row, and then there's the two rows on the bottom. So you can see the sheath, and then the Jacobson's organ sits on the top. They have huge jaw muscles, both for, uh, for biting down, but also for manipulating their jaws, giving them the strength um, to be manipulated around prey. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is their throat. There's a nasty spit. And then their windpipe at the bottom. So it's closed right now, but their trachea is super rigid. Um, if you've ever seen a video of a large snake eating um, like a deer, for example, they shove their windpipe far forward underneath the prey and they can actually breathe while like a 120 pound deer is weighing on their windpipe. So pretty strong, really hard to choke a snake out especially a python, um, but just how distinct there's muscles that uh, allow it to be pushed forward, to be pushed to the side so they can continue to breathe while they swallow their prey, which is pretty interesting. So on albino snakes, it's pretty easy to see the heat pits. Um, there's a Burmese python on the left and a reticulated python on the right. They have those deep heat pits. Um, it allows them to hunt warm-blooded prey, which is their specialization, especially when they get large. And um, those are important to keep in mind during feeding. If a snake doesn't have interest in food, pardon me, um, heating up their food above room temperature will stimulate those senses in combination with their sense of smell, and that can help uh, encourage them to eat. So space, there isn't a hard or fast rule for how much space you give a large constrictor. Um, it kind of depends on who you ask. Um, the expectation a lot of the time, which isn't always realistic, is that the snake will be, as an adult, well, at any size, but especially as an adult, um, able to stretch out completely. Um, but if you have a a uh, reticulated python or an anaconda, for example, that's 18 feet long. Sometimes it's difficult to accommodate them um, depending on the size of your facility and the space that you have like in a reptile building or in any of your exhibit halls. Usually if most of the snake, pardon me, can stretch out and then some of it goes along the other side, it's okay. I really um, don't think that large constrictors, uh, snakes in general, really reflect on that kind of thing. Um, if they want to move, they'll move. If it means looping around an enclosure, they'll do it. Um, it's not the most important part of husbandry. Um, you want to give them space to exercise. If they don't have space to exercise, you can take them out for that as well, which is easier in smaller snakes than larger. But ideally for a lot of these species, 
you want to provide a place to submerge, which isn't, again, it isn't always possible. And those needs can be met through humidity. But having space to stretch out, a uh, place to submerge and opportunities for climbing, even in really large individuals, all, they're all, they'll be used by those snakes. If you don't offer them, I honestly don't think the snake is gonna wanna know why not. Um, there's, it comes down to, with a lot of reptiles that are very large, you want to check as many boxes as possible, but you might not be able to check all of them. There's a variety of things that we run into as institutions that limit our ability to provide every opportunity we can for an animal, if it's through budget or infrastructure, all of those things. Um, but they do appreciate those opportunities for climbing and for swimming if they can give them, if you can give them. Um, but I don't believe that's really gonna be a make or break chat window. Recommendations for heights. Um, I do have enclosure, enclosure photos that we'll look at in a moment. Um, I will answer that in a moment. Thank you for asking. Now it's not gonna cooperate with me. Boom. We'll go back to, in a second, it'll be, um, you're welcome, sorry, Claire. In a second, we'll talk about some of the different types of housing that you can offer. Um, I try not to give, I guess I could, you know, you can always create an ideal dimension that you would have for an enclosure. Um, but what I've learned from working in large and small zoos is that most of the time you have what you have. Um, and there's definitely ways to make enclosures more complex so that if you don't have a lot of floor space, you have opportunities for them to, like at Fort Worth, I have a photo later on. We had a big cement tree in the center that had uh, like buttresses coming off of it. And we also had a bunch of climbing structures. So the snake couldn't like, stretch out end to end, but it could go around the tree and it was able to stretch out its full length that way. So there's other ways to encourage them to stress out, stress out, to stretch out that we'll talk about. Um, the bigger issue, in my opinion, in housing is proper heating um, and humidity. Uh, these snakes are not, they will bask, but a lot of them are a, a tropical brown, ground dwelling species. They're not gonna be up at treetops in the rainforest um, or in the environment where they're found in the wild. Um, so they usually have a pretty humid, pretty warm environment where they're found. So they'll be under several layers of canopy for, canopy, <laughs> canopy for the most part. Um, and UV is not typically required. Um, that's debatable when it comes to snake care. We had uh, grow lights like for our plants, like at Fort Worth, um, but it can be really hard to provide UV to an indoor snake enclosure in the inten intensity that you need for it to, excuse me, be worth anything. So obviously there's only a certain amount of space before the UV doesn't reach the animal. Um, and when you have a 10 or 12 or 16 foot snake in an enclosure that is as tall as the building, it's gonna be really difficult to provide UV, but thankfully it doesn't seem to compromise uh, their health and development to have it. Temperature on the other hand is very important. Um, you need, and again, I, I avoid recommended temperatures, but most snakes, most snakes, uh, between 80 to 85, 85 growing up, reading everything that I have, it's always been recommended as like, ideal. You can have temperatures lower, you can have temperatures higher, but 80 to 85 allows them to digest their food if they're found in areas that are a little bit higher temperature. Too cool? Depends. They, uh, snakes have a kind of a threshold of when they're capable of digesting their prey. <laughs> so, pardon me, that's so disgusting, I'm sorry. Um, a lot of times you can't really heat a room as high as you need it to go. Um, and the best option is to set an ambient temperature where the snake would be able to digest if anything happened to the higher heat source. And this can be really hard to achieve with lights, especially in some of these larger enclosures. Um, there are a number of mechanisms that 
you can buy now that are uh, wall mounted heaters that can help some institutions have um, heating and ventilation that's built into the enclosure like an actual room. Um, but as far as setting an ambient temperature going below 80, uh, especially this also has to be paired with humidity, um, especially. <laughs> Okay, thank you. We'll talk about that after. Um, so especially pairing with humidity, that is, uh, is vital. So these snakes, if they're kept in cooler temperatures, but they also have really high humidity, you're gonna have a colder, wetter environment and that can promote respiratory issues. Um, part of the problem is as well, is to provide that high humidity for their health. Um, it has to be able to be ventilated well. So if the enclosure is not uh, thawing out, if it's not drying out in between or drying enough, you get fungus buildup, you can get bacterial buildup and that can lead to respiratory infections. So high temperatures with the higher humidity and good ventilation are ideal. That's something that um, can cause unique challenges depending on the setup and um, it's just sometimes you have to get creative with the solutions for that. And some one thing that you have to be pretty careful with as well when we're talking about heat lights, uh, some enclosures like the ones that we had at Fort Worth, they had, and this is at Niabi Zoo, was very similar to this, but the ceiling was lower. Um, we had spotlights above the mesh. And that protected snakes from direct contact with heat lights and ceramic heat emitters. Um, I've seen enclosures with mounted lights that it's fine. I've seen enclosures with mounted lights that result in extreme burns. Um, it really depends um, on your setup, but a lot of times you wanna have lights covered so that there's no thermal burn possibility as well as uh, large constrictors pulling lights down. Um, as far as height goes, um, it kind of depends. Um, usually you want it to be able to be a high enough enclosure that you can walk into it um, and stand up comfortably so you're not stooping the whole time. Um, stooping over while servicing a large snake's enclosure can be dangerous. Uh, and if you're providing opportunities for climbing, making sure that whatever the roof of the enclosure is made out of um, that it's secure so that the snake can't brace itself against branches and push meshing up and off. So Niabi Zoo, I do like that enclosure. It is large. The retake has a lot of space, um, but you just want to be careful for mounted heating mechanisms. So there's many different ways to house large snakes. Um, every institution is different. Um, exhibits you usually have a lot of aesthetics that, um, that uh, are important for public viewing. So it's important to have a naturalistic enclosure um, and also provide the strength and the variability in the enclosure for the snake's benefit as well. Um, snakes that like to submerge themselves in, and have a highly amphibious lifestyle like anacondas, a lot of times you have majority of the space will be um, water for soaking, but they need space to haul out and they'll use it uh, to dry off, to bask and the like. And so there's not one way to do it. Usually you wanna have enough room. So if they haul out, their whole body can come out and that can be through, this is at Houston Zoo. It can be suspended above the water or you can have a shore area. One issue that you run into with snakes that are this large is that they will crush plants. Um, some are more destructive than others, but just their normal locomotion and wanting to climb in some cases, they'll, uh, they have a tendency to crush foliage. And there's ways that you can plant live plants in an exhibit without them being destroyed. Um, at Fort Worth, about twice a year, we bought new plants for our berm. Um, some of our palms were strong enough for them, but most of the other stuff was not. You can also do the live plants in um, places in uh, or nooks and crannies in perching, um, do some smaller 
plants in there where they're not going to be crushed. Um, or you can use fake plants. One thing with fake plants, um, they need to be washed. I mean, live plants need to be rinsed as well, but uh, there's ways that you can plant an enclosure and still have those plants survive, but it can be challenging with some species. So climbing opportunities are important as well. Um, having high platforms for uh, reticulated and Burmese pythons in particular, the rock pythons, they'll be used for resting and for basking. We had uh, in our reticulated python enclosures at Serpent Safari, we had big cement pillars um, that are very large retics. We had a large female that was around 15 or 16 feet. And um, she would fit her whole body on like a four by four surface. And that was elevated above the service door, which was frightening, um, but it gave her an opportunity to be above any of you know, the guests that came in if we were servicing. She wanted to have that vantage point and that um, place to retreat. And um, they'll definitely use it if it's, if it's there. This was the enclosure, <coughs> pardon me. This is the enclosure we had at Fort Worth uh, for our Burmese Python. Um, one thing that we did have to do is when we brought in new logs for perching, a lot of times we had to cement them in very large snakes like this one um, is 125 pound male, which was one of the largest male Burmese pythons I'd ever seen. Um, he was big enough to push over large stumps, large logs. And so we usually had them cemented or bolted and so that they couldn't be manipulated too much um, to break glass. Though, to be honest, um, this enclosure's glass panel was busted by somebody running into it with a mobile scooter. Um, while I was on vacation. Uh, so the snake didn't do that, an old lady did it. Um, but making sure that those climbing opportunities are secure. The vines that we had were a grapevine from outside. And um, we didn't put them up for climbing, but we had cloth rope vines that you make uh, for exhibits. And our berm would put all of his weight on them. So he actually, we put, he'd climb over the rope binding that we had. We had to pull it down and replace it because we never expected him to climb on them. Um, so you, you might not think that they'll test it, but they will. And this enclosure was kind of difficult to work in just because we had this giant stump in front of the door that discouraged the snake from being there, but it also made it very difficult to enter and exit the enclosure. Uh, and, um, but there were places that he really liked to sit in the buttresses and it gave him a lot of opportunities to thermoregulate. Um, we had heating elements in uh, like a vent system in the enclosure that brought in hot air. And we had basking lights that were installed. We had these giant basking lights that were installed above the meshing, um, but it was difficult in the winter, even in Texas to keep that, enclosure warm enough. We had to bump up heat in the winter because it was by the front door um, and it cooled the exhibit down considerably during certain parts of the year. Pardon me. Substrates, you usually wanna use a naturalistic substrate. Um, it's aesthetically pleasing. It helps absorb water um, and waste. And because these snakes are heavier, you wanna make sure you flip it fluff and flip it so it doesn't get packed down too much um, and so that it doesn't get packed down and soaked with urate. So keeping the enclosure clean is very important. Uh, there can be issues sometimes with keeping enclosures clean um, when staff are fearful of the snake. Um, if the enclosure isn't set up in a way that's easy to surface, it can make it difficult for staff to clean as well. So do your best to keep it clean. The biggest challenge uh, a lot of the times is their urate and the uh, liquid urine that they expel. So really large snakes, when they urinate, there will be the semi-solid urate, and then there's a ton of liquid and it can soak whole sections of bedding. And a lot of the time, by the time the keeper goes to clean, what you see on the surface will be the urate and all of the liquid urine soaks into the substrate and that all has to be removed. 
So having soaked substrates um, in um, a humid environment can encourage bacteria growth. And it's important to remember that when they urinate, it's not just that semi-solid, but also uh, bits of skin that happens a lot in enclosures. You'll have a snake that sheds. They don't always shed in one piece. There's scraps all over the place. You have to scrape it off. Um, that's all just part of their care. But it is important going back to the, to the urates in particular, that it's not left to sit, um, that you do regular substrate changes, um, that you take out whole sections of substrate that's been soiled, um, and that you don't leave the urates in. So it's something that I've seen at other institutions. And it's just, there could be a variety of reasons for why it's difficult to clean enclosures, but it's just important to remember to clean up all of their waste. Off exhibit is challenging um, for the same reasons that we just discussed. Um, and when you have a large snake in an enclosure that is not built the way an exhibit is, you run into a lot of issues with providing the opportunities that snakes need for physical and mental stimulation. And one of the biggest issues is obviously dealing with that waste uh, in an environment where you're usually lining the flooring with paper. Uh, usually you can use, people will use uh, wood, uh, shredded wood bedding. They'll use newspaper, they'll use paper towel. Sometimes people will use, uh, pee pads that you use for dogs, but no matter what you use, it, inquire, it requires a lot more cleaning, um, especially when the snake urinates. We did have to house, because someone backed into that enclosure, we did have to house our Burmese python in uh, a vision cage uh, that was not big enough. Um, it was the only option because having uh, enclosures, you can hand build them or you can have, um, you can buy the specialty made enclosures and even ones that are enormous are extremely expensive. And when the snake would defecate and urinate, we had to soak it up with towels. It was so much that even if we had several inches of substrate, um, it would just soak it. And so you would have to pull everything out and it was just created quite a challenge, more of a challenge than you would anticipate. Um, to, the, for the substrate changes at Fort Worth, we did entire substrate changes every quarter about. Um, it kind of depended. It depended on kind of the quality of the substrate, um, how messy the snake had been. Um, and then if we replanted, we did change quite a bit of the substrate um, to add in the soil that we needed to keep the plants alive. Um, but sometimes you would do like a quarter or a third of an enclosure, you'd have to change that substrate. And um, we had it pre-mixed in these giant like dumpster size tubs. And so it was a pre-mixed substrate that you just brought in. Um, it can be a lot, a lot, a lot of substrate if you have a big walk-in enclosure. So going on to feeding, um, feeding is one of the coolest parts about keeping large snakes because they eat really big prey. Uh, if you're allowed to feed your snakes during open hours, um, it's a huge draw. People like to see it because snakes don't shake their prey apart or roll it apart or anything like that. It's usually not gory. They swallow it whole, so there's no chewing or pulling or viewing of organs, all the things that people usually have an issue with. And then just being able to see an animal that large consume um, an even larger prey item, it engages the public and people will stand there for an hour in some cases and watch the entire thing happen. Also, I noticed too that people will come back later to see when it was done. And so it really did keep people engaged at an exhibit longer than if the snake was just sitting there itself. The only thing that really rivals that is when you're in the enclosure. So if you're servicing in an exhibit with a large snake in it, even if the snake is asleep on the other side of the room, um, people will watch you the entire time, uh, which I always thought was really interesting. So with snake digestion, 
and feeding large prey items. Um, snakes digestive process is an arms race against the decomposition of a prey item. And so having uh, suitable temperatures and then uh, suitable prey sizes allows them for proper digestion. But one of the issues when it comes to digestion is uh, cooler temperatures can cause the uh, arresting of the digestive process. And that can lead to regurgitation because of uh, the prey going septic. This isn't something that we really run into um, in most cases. Um, or occasional, you know, sometimes snakes will occasion, occasionally regurgitate um, and that's not so much of an issue, but a lot of the time, which I think I can just skip to this, um, you usually choose prey that's about as thick as the thickest part of the snake. So our Burmese python in this, in this photo, um, he's large. Um, he was over, pardon me, over conditioned, but because we had a nutrition department, um, they delivered a large rabbit every two weeks. Um, he would eat every two months. Um, and it wasn't because the prey was big. It really wasn't. Um, it was just that he had been fed so consistently and the same big prey item that he had put on weight. He was satiated. He wasn't hurting for food. And so that's something that you run into sometimes with nutrition departments is justifying which in my experience at big zoos, um, they do not like it when you fast a snake, even if it's a snake, like some of these individuals could go over a year without eating and they would be okay. Like they wouldn't pass away. They'd lose weight, it would be fine, but it's really difficult sometimes to convince nutrition and commissary that, that that's okay. And we had that happen um, as well. We would just feed our rabbit to the crocs because um, we couldn't convince them that this was an okay practice for a snake that was this large. Um, so offering prey as big as the biggest part of the snake is a good rule of thumb. It's not that they can't handle bigger. Obviously, we talked about their anatomy with their head and their jaws. And uh, as the snake grows, obviously, you increase prey size. Um, I only mention that because there's been people in the past that have mentioned kind of a slow growth in younger snakes or a very intense appetite. And it turns out they're feeding things that are like the size of the snake's head, um, which you see that rule sometimes in frogs and lizards. Um, but you just gently say the snakes um, needs to be bigger. That's why it's hungry. So they're very opportunistic in the wild. And in Burmese pythons in particular, they're usually always willing to eat. A lot of big snakes will eat if you offer. Um, their eyes are bigger than their stomach. Well, not technically because their stomach's huge, but um, the amount that they eat will vary over time of year, um, density of prey. And so when you do weekly feeding schedules, um, that's not really how it happens in the wild. Sometimes they'll eat multiple times. Um, if it's smaller prey items, if they have a larger prey item, they won't eat for quite a while. Um, there'll be times of the year where they eat more frequently and then they may not if there's other things involved like breeding, um, nesting, birth, that type of thing. But there's ways to tell when a snake is ready to eat. Usually your combination of, of factors will be behavioral indicators. So the activity level of the snake, um, their interest in you um, when you enter an enclosure and not to eat you necessarily, but the movement attracts them. Um, and then also body condition of the snake, which we just started talking about with the, the berm that I worked with. So again, some snakes will eat no matter what. Um, they don't always have to eat when they're hungry. And you usually want to have large constrictors similar in appearance to, to wild type which that Burmese python was obviously not. Um, you want them to be on the leaner side. Um, people do notice that snakes are fat, but they don't really seem to have a problem with it compared to some other animals, which is interesting. But there's been more and more kind of uh, posts and conversation recently about obesity and snake, snakes and how very large snakes, you see them as obese, but smaller individuals 
are also considered obese because of their fat storage. And so if they're huge, huge, they're definitely fat. You can have thin fat. I don't know. So a uh, healthy body condition um, in large snakes, they'll have that dip behind their head to their neck. So they'll have a decipherable neck. Um, the other big factor is going to be the transition from the end of their body to their tail. So their vent underneath, that's where they expel. And then the tail um, in uh, lean snakes, there'll be a smooth transition. You won't usually be able to tell where the tail starts. Um, males, because they keep their genitals in their tail base, they'll have more of a formation, but I'll show you in a, in a second. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, for the boa constrictors, having that tall body, uh, for other constrictor, constricting species, you'll have more of a round body shape, but it shouldn't sag at the bottom, which we'll show, I'll show in a moment. And then the skin should be tight with the scales overlapping. And when you run your hand down them, you might be able to feel um, the ribs. You usually can't feel the back so much, but um, it should just be lean. You don't want fat, fat. So over condition snake that uh, Burmese python on the top, that's a pretty extreme example. Um, that was a snake that Peoria Zoo got um, as a rescue. So I'm not judging anybody on their snake's appearance, um, but you can see going from the head to the neck, very thick. And then the way that the skin hangs on the bottom. Um, and then the bottom photograph, that transition from body to tail. So one thing that I do wanna say about that transition is that if a snake is close to defecating, sometimes there'll be a bunch of poop in the back and there will be a pretty clear difference between body and tail. Also gravid snakes or pregnant snakes, they're going to have, um, that bigger body section before the tail. So I'm talking about not pregnant, not ready to poop snakes, um, will have a smooth transition. Um, in some extreme circumstances, the snakes will be so fat that there's, the scales are separated. So you can see the skin underneath. You'll get that if they eat a large prey item because their skin's very stretchy. But a snake that hasn't recently eaten, um, that's sitting there, and you can see the skin. It's a pretty extreme example um, of obesity. On the other end, which you don't see quite as often as under conditioned animals, um, when snakes rest, they can have, especially in large snakes with their skin elasticity, they can have some rolling or folding at the coil corners. Um, but in under conditioned snakes, you'll have, uh, or dehydrated, which they usually are in the same circumstances, It'll have the sharp folds at the coils um, where the, the skin is sticking up. Also, you can see the spine pretty clearly. You can see the ribs. You'd definitely be able to feel them if you touch them. And um, just a sagging of the skin, different sagging than you would see in a, in a fat snake. So using body condition and behavior, um, if you have a snake that's in good body condition and it wants to eat, you can feed it regularly, just keeping an eye on the body condition. Um, feast and famine feeding um, is becoming more common in reptile collections, depending on the species, but having a varied feeding schedule um, where you take a couple weeks longer in between, or you feed um, several smaller food items, or you feed more frequently over the next couple of weeks, Doing that kind of thing, um, whether it's on purpose or because of lack of staff, in some cases, it helps stimulate um, their digestion. So snakes, when they're digesting prey, uh, the organs involved in digestion, including uh, their heart, they enlarge considerably um, when a snake has eaten and that stimulates those body systems. And then when they're finished digesting, they literally shrink. And so that having that system, those systems stimulated irregularly um, would be closest to how their bodies are stimulated in the wild. Again, if you have a nutrition department, 
it can be difficult. Um, I know a lot of times with snake feeding in zoos, nutrition doesn't send you your frozen thawed. In most cases, you pull it yourself and that gives you a little bit more control. Um, but we've talked about that in previous feedings. For feeding safety, you have to be very careful. Um, and I don't mean to play these animals up. Goodness, it's already an hour. Um, I won't take too long. But um, feeding is a, is a dangerous time. I don't think that large snakes are like something that you go in and you're anxious and you're scared and you don't want to do it and you could get killed and all this other stuff. But it's just the realism of working with a large snake um, and knowing what they're capable of. And for feeding large snakes, um, that's an opportunity where you can get into a situation that um, could potentially be very dangerous because a feeding response in a snake is different than a defensive response. And so if you are feeding large prey like rabbits, uh, like we did with our Burmese python, a lot of times the tools that you have are like shorter, stouter tongs, um, like the ones pictured, sometimes the ones with the wider grabbers, but it can be really hard to haul prey. Uh, it's basically hauling a rabbit on a stick. It's very difficult. Um, it can be pretty taxing on your arms, but it's important that the prey is kept in front of you. Um, even though they have those heat pits, a snake that's excited by the presence of food can behave really, they can strike really haphazardly. And whatever they bite, and in cases of um, cohabbed individuals, could be another snake, uh, but they'll just bite it and constrict it. And then at some point, if it's another snake, they realize it. If it's you, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, so hand feeding, I just think hand feeding a snake, if you're tossing it, that's different, but feeding from your hand, knowing the snake, I understand all those things come into play. It's just not safe. Um, the instances which there was one recently with reticulated python is private ownership. Um, uh, private owner deaths by large snakes seem to happen more often than you ever see in zoos, um, but it's important that you limit those occurrences as much as possible, not just for your personal safety, but just for um, the message that you want to send about an animal. People already think these snakes are going to eat you. Um, and so avoiding getting bit is very important. And, and when the snake grabs the prey, if you move it around, that'll stimulate natural behavior of constriction. Um, some snakes do lose that response in captivity, but it doesn't mean it's bad. A lot of times people will say, oh, like if you have a gentle feeder, uh, any snake species, or when you're using pre-killed prey, people get really upset sometimes about the snake not being uh, as aggressive of a feeder as they otherwise would be. I don't know, the snake is eating the way that it wants to. If it doesn't want to constrict it, doesn't mean that, the, that it lost out on an opportunity for natural behavior. It's just adapted to the presence of pre-killed prey. It's not a, a big deal. Um, but for snakes, always feeding at ground level, trailing the prey um, can stimulate uh, a snake's interest. Um, and then the different, the ways that you move prey around, pardon me, everybody has their technique, but one thing to, uh, I guess not avoid, cause not every snake really cares. But if you like hold prey by its tail, when you dangle it in front of snakes, some snakes get scared of it. Um, also like hitting it in the face with it or hitting its body, um, a hundred pound snake can become very irritated or fearful in those instances. So if you run into that, taking like a submissive approach where the prey is at or below the snake's level and then kind of erratic movements. Um, sometimes if you do it, they love when you have erratic movements away from them. That really stimulates that response. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and say pre-killed prey is recommended. Very large snakes eating. I mean, even when you look at rats, um, they have uh, legomorphs and rodents have staple like teeth that if you've ever been bitten by them yourself, you know, it can be pretty intense. Um, and you just want to avoid that. It's just unnecessary to risk the snake. 
these snakes are built for that type of reaction that we understand that that snakes that go after really large prey that's going to be prey that's struggling they're going to have a variety of defenses yeah the snake can handle it in captivity it kind of comes down to is it necessary it's not necessary for a snake to have injuries from prey in captivity they're going to eat frozen thawed prey give it to them um, if you do uh, live feeding sometimes, like we used to get pheasants donated to us, chickens donated to us, people that didn't care if we fed them out or not, we would. Um, and the snakes had really strong reactions to it. Um, and that was good for them. I don't think it should never happen. There's going to be cases where live prey stimulates a picky feeder. Um, but when it comes down to the snake's safety and then public perception, which is a reality. Um, people do know that in the wild, a lot of terrible things happen that they might not like, um, but you do have to cater to the public in those instances. And even though snakes do kill prey fairly quickly, um, it's not always a painless experience and you can still get a lot of their natural behaviors from pre-killed prey. So sorry for the photos. But just to make the point, um, even mice can really hurt smaller snakes. So if you can avoid this, there's no reason why the snake would have to endure this. Um, this happens both, and I'll skip this so we don't have to look at it. This happens both uh, when a snake is constricting prey, they can get bit. Um, I've seen it um, in anacondas and other snakes. When you feed live prey, the prey is going to do everything it can. If it can reach to bite, it is going to bite the snake. Um, but in other instances, when the snake is given live prey and it's left alone, that's when you get those severe bites. Um, if something happens and the snake is put off of its feeding response and it becomes fearful, because sometimes rats will walk right up to snakes and the snake's like, what? then they're gonna be, that reaction's kind of, they're shaken up, they're not gonna to try to hurt it, and that's where they can get hurt. Um, obviously, a lot of times, if you put a rabbit in with a snake, most people wouldn't walk away, uh, but it's just recommended. Also, for, for, for food storage, it's easier to have frozen thawed stored than it is to have a colony of rabbits and guinea pigs and rats. People do like to do that. But if you have snakes there eating full-size rabbits, um, a little bit easier uh, to have those frozen. But um, as far as stimulating appetite, um, there's certain things that you can look at if a snake is refusing to feed. If a snake is over-conditioned, uh, like the python I mentioned before, they're not going to really want to eat. Um, some will just continue to eat, and that's when you're the determiner. Um, but some just don't want it. They don't want it, then don't force them. Um, sometimes if the temperatures aren't high enough, um, if they're stressed out or if they're ill, they won't be interested in eating even if they're in good body condition. And so environment and health have to become uh, come into play in determining those things. So stimulating appetite, if you have animals, and this goes into enrichment as well, if you have animals that... Uh, are not wanting to eat or they're pickier, but they're on the thinner side, they don't have any medical conditions, the temperature and the housing is correct. Um, there's other things that you can try. Birds are a good one. Um, a lot of snakes really like birds. Um, and it's just, it'll trigger their feeding response easier than mammals sometimes, whether it's just a novel scent, that might be it as well. Uh, one other thing that I learned from my supervisor at Fort Worth was um, spitting on the prey's face. So snakes orient towards the head of their prey uh, through smelling saliva uh, of the prey and also uh, lay of fur or lay of feathers. But if you, <laughs> I laughed at her when she told me, but uh, if you put your spit on the snout of prey, that can help. Doesn't always help. It's not an end all be all, but I thought I would share. Um, feeding along the shoreline for anacondas to, to trigger that behavior of stalking from the water, um, heating up the prey, which you don't always have to do. It can, can depend on the snake. Um, feeding at night, feeding when the public's not there, if it depends on the animal, some snakes don't care about anything that happens outside their enclosure. Uh, some snakes, when they're 
engaged with prey, uh, the movement and the banging on glass by the public in that aroused state can distract them from eating. Um, some snakes, it seems like if they are distracted, um, it's like the prey disappears and they have to be re-offered. Um, so they're all different, snakes are all different. There, you can also bully feed. Um, it doesn't work with every snake. And basically what you do is they're sensitive along behind their head and their neck. A lot of times when you press prey against that side of their neck, that'll initiate uh, a bite. And a lot of times it's a bite and latch. Um, and I've worked with snakes that want to eat. Their body language shows you that they want to eat, but they had a preference for that tactile trigger. It was really strange. Um, but that's something that when you're working with a snake that doesn't want to eat and its body conditioning is deteriorating, then you try some of the other tactics. Force feeding is very difficult um, in larger snakes. And usually um, if it gets to that point, there's some other underlying condition. But sometimes snakes like to be pushed into eating. We always called it bully feeding. Bully feeding is technically a term for like indigo snakes, which are really aggressive, strong feeders that don't constrict. They just push their prey against the ground and bite it as hard as they can. <coughs> um, I saw your question, but for the sake of time, I'll wait till the end, sorry. So poop really quickly. So snake poop, a large snake's poop, uh, is huge. And um, this is what it looks like. I always tell people dog poop. Um, usually it's well formed. You don't want too dry, but you also don't want diarrhea. Um, and then as far as urates, usually white and yellow urate, it's uh, semi-solid when it comes out, it usually dries into like a rock. Um, but then there will be a lot of the liquid waste as well. Um, Snakes tend to go to the bathroom in the water. They also tend to go to the bathroom when they're stimulated um, to crawl around. And sometimes I just wanted to mention green urate. Green urate usually contains um, uh, bile and sometimes it can be an issue with uh, kidney. And if it's chronic, um, if you have chronic urate or uh, green urate or like, really mucousy, dark color, blood, those types of things. Um, sometimes you get it once and you don't really know what happened. You never see it again. But if you have discolored urate or especially, well, I don't, not to be gross, but some snakes poop is so big that they have blood when they go to the bathroom. Um, but you know what I mean? If it's off and you think something's wrong, then uh, their waste can be an indica indicator like other animals. So a lot of times these snakes are kept in walk-in enclosures. Um, depending on the enclosure, there can be uh, visual blockers like um, logs, cement trees, rocks, um, rock work um, that can kind of block you from a large snake. Um, you wanna keep them from sitting right in front of the door. That can be a challenge. Usually like we did that with the, the stump at Fort Worth. It kept the snake from sitting there, but I also had to climb over it to get in and out. Um, having a clear entryway, it's, it's important, but it doesn't seem to be important in exhibit design um, from what I've seen. There's always some sort of challenge with uh, doors to large walk-in reptile exhibits. Um, sometimes you can work around the snake. You always wanna bring in a tool, whether it's a snake hook you can bring in a broom, just have something with you. The times that you don't are the times when something happens. Um, if a snake strikes at a broom, it's different than it striking at your foot or your leg. Um, and a lot of times zoos will have a two person system where uh, you might have a spotter, but a lot of times, depending on the number of staff you call when you enter and exit an exhibit. And I think these are important. Um, even when you have a large snake that's relatively docile, um, if you say you're going into an enclosure and then nobody, you, nobody hears from you for two hours and they know you're not doing a project, they'll think of you 
maybe. Um, but it can also help if you do have a large snake that's aggressive or you have a, a, an enclosure that's a tighter squeeze to have someone let you know when the snake is aroused. That sounds terrible, but yeah, when it's awake, uh, notices your presence, approaches you, you should be looking at the snake, but having a second person doesn't help, it doesn't hurt. Um, and it's very important to do your best to work around a snake that's uh, particularly aggressive to keep them clean, to clean where you can, when you can. If you have to move a snake, a lot of times if you wake them up to move them, they'll get kind of huffy and they'll move away from you um, at usually a slower pace. And then you can clean the area where they packed everything down and sat in their own urate, which they don't really seem to care about. Um, as far as being eaten, I know you guys probably know this, but uh, you're not just going to get eaten by a large snake. The bigger issue is biting and constricting. And so large snakes have big teeth. We looked at their teeth. The teeth are relative to the size of the snake. They're huge and huge animals. And snakes hit really hard when they strike. Um, if you get hit by a large constrictor, a lot of times it'll bruise up, it'll swell up. Um, I've been bit on the hand and it looks like you slammed it in a car door. It has a very, it's a very um, unique bite. Any snake bite because of their needle teeth is just kind of is a weird experience compared to like a lizard. And there's two main types of bites, which is defensive, um, a bite and release, uh, like a back off bite, and then a, a feeding response, which is a grab and hold on. Um, and that poses more significant consequences, of course. So entering the exhibit, uh, we talk, I already talked a little bit about these things, having a second person. Um, if you can work in the enclosure without the snake waking up, that's great. If you don't have to wake it up, sometimes it'll sleep the whole time. Um, a sleeping snake won't be flicking its tongue. It'll be resting. Um, the eyes won't be moving. Usually the respiration is lower uh, and they aren't really responding to anything. So even though they, their eyes are open, they do rest. And if you touch a snake, and it jumps, even though you are visually in its line of sight, it was sleeping. Um, we don't necessarily know what that type of sleep looks like, but you know when you startle them that they weren't, they weren't aware of you regardless. Um, and having a spotter does help. It also helps to keep the public from distracting you. The pe people love when you look at them when you're in an enclosure or you respond to them. My favorite is when you're standing against the glass and someone is standing on the other side. Like if there was no glass there, you would never ever do that. It used to happen all the time when I was in that uh, berm enclosure at Fort Worth because it was such a tight space. But people don't let them distract you or service before open hours, that's not always possible. Um, but having someone out on the floor too, uh, helps to kind of explain what you're doing and why you're doing it and the safety of, of servicing a large animal. Um, you always want to reorient a snake that's approaching you. So you can use the tool to do that. So if you go in and, and, and a, there's, a, there's a difference between curiosity and feeding interest. So a snake might orient towards you out of curiosity. It's usually kind of passive. They'll tongue flick. They might not. They're just resting. Um, a snake that starts to go towards you, that has a tight uh, body posture, lots of tongue flicking, kind of like an erratic jerking forward. Um, that's, it could be aggressive, but it could also be feeding response and you never wanna figure out which one it is. So you can push the snake out of the way. Um, their face is sensitive, obviously, like most animals, including us. So if you touch them, usually they'll, They'll either coil back and then reorient or they'll turn out of the way. And it's important uh, to have a tool available to do that and not use your foot or boot um, for obvious reasons. So tools important, even though it can be really annoying and it can get caught on things in the enclosure. If you have to reorient a snake, you don't wanna use your body part. So defensive behavior and biting um, they have, they're different than feeding response. Feeding response is quiet. Uh, it's very, uh, it has intent. 
the animal's oriented towards you, it has intense interest towards you, it has tight coils, uh, the respiration is increasing, you don't hear anything, that's a feeding response. But then on the other hand, you have defensive, which is more common, I would say. Uh, apprehensive snakes will hiss. Um, a snake that gets pissed um, will have a, like a growling, rumbling hiss as well. Uh, and they'll open their mouth at you. So snakes can close mouth hiss, but they will open mouth gape at you as well. Um, this is a defensive posture in a boa. This is a very defensive posture. So you can have the essing up, which is that tight coil, and you can have exaggerated essing, which is very similar to like the stance that a rattlesnake gives you. And that's when you see those big deep breaths. They'll take a a huge deep breath in and just let out a giant hiss. And um, when they're irritated, a lot of larger snakes, their tail will go. They're, they'll do that sometimes pre-strike for food, but they'll, their tail will wag, it'll whip back and forth um, or it'll kind of undulate. Um, and in extreme situations, like if you're restraining a snake, um, they'll defecate, they'll urinate and they'll musk. And that is like, uh, it's just the most distressed a snake can exhibit, uh, especially musking and in adult snakes, they can shoot musk several feet. Um, it's impressive. I wouldn't have believed it if it didn't happen, but, uh, a snake that's this upset there, they will bite you, but you also realize that biting brings their head close to you. So the hissing, the posturing, um, that is, a. uh, uh, an attempt to create space. And so approaching it will instigate, if you see this and you back off, uh, I, you wouldn't push it. Don't push it, especially if you have um, adults of some of these really large species. And then they'll also shove you. And a lot of times they'll do that too. When you're trying to move them around an exhibit, they'll uh, shove their coil outwards to get you to back off, to stop touching them. Um, and that's defensive as well. So I've been bit by a large snake. Um, okay, placement, I would say thigh is better than abdomen, it's better than face, better than neck, better than hand. Uh, but I was bit by that Burmese python um, that we had at Fort Worth. And it was for very specific reasons, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, it was the third type of bite, which is frustrated. And I'll talk about that when we get to handling, but as someone that's experienced a pretty passive bite, um, as far as a major, like a large snake bite, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, their teeth are so thin and long that there are complications if you got bit by a very large snake, both for embedding of teeth, but also uh, in this picture, the bottom, bite mark was the top of the mouth and the weight of the snake pulled the head down and created slots. Um, in some instances, if a snake hits you and the weight pulls it down, it'll just shred. So this was nothing compared to the possibility. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because uh, there's complacency sometimes. You see it in working with venomous, but it's the same with working with large snakes. You can work with a really large snake your whole life. There's gonna be external or internal stimuli for that animal that can change its behavior. And you just don't wanna forget what they're capable of. And that's just to create respect. It's not to create fear, but realize you're working with uh, a very, very powerful animal. So feeding response bites uh, are problematic. Um, there's different, levels. So we already talked about the orientation of the snake, how they uh, react to your presence. You will have seen a feeding response through feeding your animal. The difference between a curious snake and a snake that is very interested because it smells something that it wants. Um, it'll be quiet. And keep in mind that their strike range with uh, many snakes is a lot longer than you think. Part of it is from Good Lord. Part of it is from that inching movement. So they'll be S'd up, but they're inching forward. 
So they're closer to you and then they already have a quarter of their length available to them for striking. So if you don't feel safe, just leave the enclosure because some feeding responses um, are very difficult to get out of depending on the size of the animal. Hello, are you playing? Oh, there we go. Uh, this is a feeding response in a Woma python. So we had Womas at Fort Worth and um, they were so feeding oriented that the best way to service their enclosure was to let them grab your sweater and hold on um, because it was very difficult to hook them out. They got very ornery, but the bite, the, the, the bite and latch, and then they throw coils. It's different in Womas because they tend to be pinners. So they're, they're constrictors, but they pin um, prey in burrows a lot of the time, but in large snakes, it's gonna be constricting. Um, there's different ways to disengage a snake that is bitten and latched. Um, you can run them underwater. Uh, you can use mouthwash or alcohol. Um, and you can gently, depending like a snake this size, you can push the head forward. You can use um, credit card and disengage the teeth that way if it's a smaller snake. Um, and it kind of depends. Sometimes if you just unwrap a snake from your hand, if you pinch it gently, if you touch the head, sometimes they'll just let go. There's different, um, depends on the situation. Some snakes are in the zone and they have to be disengaged using an irritant like mouthwash or alcohol. Um, but it's just kind of snapping the snake out of it without necessarily hurting it. Um, that's why you always start with the lighter stuff and move uh, on from there. But when it comes to huge snakes, um, the methods can get pretty intense. And this is why it, you need to avoid it in all situations because when it comes down to you are the snake, these snakes that are housed in these exhibits are capable of killing a person. That's when you make those hard choices of harming the animal in order to save somebody's life. Um, I know that there are individuals that will say, just let it take me. Um, when it happens, you might not want that. I know it was your mistake, but a lot of times people are gonna to try to save your life. But the pounds per square inch for these snakes are intense. Uh, they are very tolerant of lactic acid buildup. They are made to not just hold, but apply increasing pressure to um, either incapacitate or kill prey. They don't necessarily squeeze to uh, crush. There's been papers, this hasn't even been recently, where a lot of the pressure is um, focused on cutting off blood flow. Uh, obviously respiration, it's hard to breathe, but they cause uh, cardiac arrest in a lot of their prey. So it's a, it doesn't have to be that much pressure to make you pass out. Um, they're more than capable of doing that. They're more than capable of stopping your heart. And so with some snakes, if you get grabbed and wrapped up, so it depends on where they grab. Let's say they grab your hand, you wrap around your hand, your arm. Usually if you have a second person or you, you use the tail, you unwrap from the tail. Sometimes they'll then wrap around the other person, but it still gives you then more leverage to remove the snake. Um, and these really large individuals, I've never seen this happen. My boss at my first job was grabbed and constricted by reticulated python. Um, those snakes, uh, when they get around your neck and your abdomen, um, they can kill you. And they are not going to let go of you on their own. They let go when the prey is dead. And so in those cases, you get into more severe circumstances of harming the snake. The problem is obviously, first of all, you are harming the animal, which you wanna avoid. So that's why we're avoiding this situation altogether. Um, but these snakes are made to take uh, resistance. And so in some cases, 
Um, they'll swallow prey that will have body parts that will puncture their skin, um, that will kick them, that will bite them, that will pinch and scratch them. And so in some cases, removal has to be uh, escalated. I'm just going to mention this because someone asked me what I thought about the severity of it. Um, that person that was constricted recently by a retic, the police were called and um, they did shoot the snake in the head to get it to let go. It was an adult reticulated python. The person was unresponsive. Um, he was transported alive to the hospital. He did die, but um, uh, I know police, I'm not even gonna get into this. I'm not even gonna talk about police. Uh, that they did what they had to to get the snake off of somebody that was going to die. Um, and so we hope that never has to come to that, but just understand that in a situation, if someone was being constricted by a large snake, you have to then respond accordingly to save that person's life. And in some cases, um, like the case in my boss that was constricted by retic, they did have to stab him, uh, the snake, pardon me. They stabbed my boss to death so they could pull his body out. Uh, they stabbed the snake and it released. Um, he did have the snake get treated for the stab wounds and the snake lived for about a year after, but uh, the severity of the wounds and infection, um, it was hard, it was a mean snake. So treatment, topical treatment was difficult, um, but he understood his mistake. Um, he understood as well, uh, what had to be done to get it off of him, but he did try to save it as a result. Anyway, amen. That's the story. So when it comes to having things that uh, you want nearby, you always want tools, um, a hose if you're not near a sink for a large snake, having an irritant like mouthwash or rubbing alcohol um, to spray in the nose and the eyes. I know that um, that it causes the burning sensation. It's very off-putting for a snake. Again, it'll survive from that. And if it's life or death, uh, the snake can deal with some irritation. Um, having a radio, if you're working in a zoo setting. And when I say weapon, I did carry a knife with me when I serviced large snakes um, because we just had a call system. So I would call when I entered and exited, um, but the snake was large enough that I could have been severely harmed and you try hard not to make mistakes, but sometimes unexpected things happen. Um, and when you're in an enclosure with one entrance and one exit, you never really know. It's just safe. It's not because I wanted to hurt the snake, wasn't anticipating it, waiting for the day that I was going to fight it on exhibit. Um, I just didn't want to get hurt if someone couldn't get to me fast enough. You know what I mean? Anyway, this is my Burmese python that I had in Texas drinking water on the floor in the kitchen. Um, she's beautiful. So safe handling to go along with that and kind of leading into um, some of the uh, other reasons why snakes can become irritable and bite is proper handling. So very large snakes have a lot of weight. It's obvious they're densely muscled. And um, even though they can be arboreal at this size and climb, um, their weight does prohibit them. And when they climb, they know how to distribute their weight. So it's different when a snake is climbing a tree than when you're handling and hauling a snake around. Um, the snake doesn't have as much control over how the weight is distributed. Um, if you haul large snakes that are docile, um, like the one in this photo, um, you don't have to restrain the head on them. Um, this is a fine picture. Um, there's just a couple of things. Uh, having a lot of hanging loops is something you wanna avoid when you're hauling a large snake. Um, and they do a fairly good job of that. The back half, you wanna be careful when you think about how a snake, I mean, if you have a 125 pound snake, the weight is distributed pretty well across the body. And so when you have a quarter or a third of that length, you think, I can't do math, so let's do 150. If, it, if it's a third of the length, you're gonna have 50 pounds of weight on one part of their vertebrae. 
and even though these snakes, you doesn't usually don't have back injuries or anything like that, that you know of, um, you don't want to put a necessary strain on their spine. Um, also having the head behind you, even if it's friendly, um, can cause issues. Doesn't have to be restrained, but having it in front of you so you can see the head, the head's where all the sharp stuff is. So that's pretty important. Um, making sure the people that are carrying it aren't afraid and aren't going to drop it um, are very important as well. Dropping a large constrictor can rupture organs, can break their ribs, um, just being careful. A lot of zoos that have large snakes, they don't usually pick up and carry them out. They stay in the exhibit. Sometimes you'll have to catch them up to move exhibit or to um, uh, put them in a container while you do a substrate change. They can't be in there for that. And so there'll be some points where they'll have to be lifted. Um, this is San Antonio Zoo. And this is exactly what I was talking about where people are shoulder to shoulder, the weight is distributed. Um, there's no part of that snake that's putting a necessary strain on the spine. The face is out front, it looks thrilled. And I feel bad for the person holding the tail because they often go to the bathroom when you have them out because it's just stimulating in a lot of ways. Um, but kids love it when you have an animal out and it poops and pees all over the place. So with very large snakes, if you have an aggressive animal, um, and this goes back to my bite and my story, um, if you think that the snake will bite you, if it's not handled, it's not docile, and in the past, it has struck when you're trying to move it, restrain the head. So if you restrain them behind the head, there's risks with snakes that are this strong, but if you do it the right way, the, everything will be minimized. But because a large snake, when it bites, uh, sorry, sorry, not when it bites, when you grab them behind the head, it's like a predator grabbing them. And a lot of the times, once they're restrained, they will throw coils um, and they can constrict predators and kill predators that are restraining them. Um, it's obviously not like the intent to eat, but when you have a big snake, that type of aggressive defensive constriction can be very dangerous as well. And so going for the head, um, there's things you have to keep in mind. One is throwing coils. So you have to be prepared to have another person um, intervene before that happens so that the snake doesn't have leverage to uh, throw coils over the person grabbing the head. Um, you want to avoid the leverage as well because snakes will often desperate, desperately try to pull out of restraint and uh, to the point where it can harm them. Uh, their only goal is to get out and so uh, it can, they can pull to the point where you feel like they're going to dislocate their spine. And so having that second person keeps them from hurting themselves as well. And if you don't grab right behind the jaws, just like two inches underneath, you would be shocked at how far they can turn to bite your hand. So that's where like the, when you go to grab and you're doing the hesitate pull back, like snakes are, they don't like that. That type of like stimulation of like, approaching, withdrawing, approaching, withdrawing. So you wanna make sure that you grab them in the right place, but it can be calculated using a tool. A lot of times when we would grab like at Serpent, you'd have a tool that you would put on the side facing you so that when you went to grab, if the snake turned, there would be a block or it can be a shovel, it can be a hook, it can be a broom. Um, and then you, when you would put it, on that side of the neck, you would line it up with the back of those jaws where their muscle is, so you could guide your hand to grab. And in some cases, in big snakes, you have to use two hands and your only job is to hold the head. You don't wanna do this for very long. The snake needs to be moved quickly. Um, and you can, so I did put wake the snake up, but if you grab it in its sleep, you probably get a more severe startled response. Either way, you're gonna get a startled response if it's a snake that has to be restrained to move. Um, but make sure that the plan is set. So when you go in, 
to restrain the animal. Everybody knows their role. Um, most of the time, a lot of people won't fit in the enclosure. So to have a person to stop the initial coil, to have the grabber, the coil blocker, and then other people that can move in once the snake is restrained. Um, and again, to have kind of that shoulder to shoulder carrying method so that there's no strain on the spine and so that the snake doesn't uh, strain itself, um, doesn't get the leverage to pull back from restraint. And um, to make sure you're not traveling like a super long distance uh, with the animal. In the case of my bite, um, we wanted to take the snake out for uh, exercise for our camp to see, our zoo camp. Um, that Burmese python that we had, he was okay. Like you could touch him, but he was so big that we didn't really take him out for any reason. Um, he hadn't been acclimated to that. And uh, the area around the door to his enclosure wasn't safe for him to kind of be encouraged out where you could walk him out on his own. There was too much electrical equipment and infrastructure and other enclosures. And so um, we hauled him out. It was so three of us or four of us. And there was so much complexity to the exhibit that it was really hard to get him out um, because he would brace on things. Um, he would wrap around things to keep you from pulling him forward. And usually by the time we actually got him out and into like hands, he had already peed, he had already musked, he was hissing, um, big rumble hisses, open mouth. And uh, in hindsight, the snake should have been restrained. And like anybody, later on it was, Maggie really should have held the head even though I was past the head unrestrained. Um, we were hauling him out and I had the head and his neck was draped over I was holding him like this and I couldn't see his head and he grabbed my thigh and it was just boom and it I bite and let go didn't really even apply any pressure just pissed agitated irritated response of I'm gonna bite because this is bullshit basically and uh, I screamed and then my boss was behind me and he grabbed my arm and then I screamed again um because he thought it was it had bit and held on but it wasn't it was quick we took the snake out, put it down on the ground. I went in the bathroom, washed it out. Um, the scariest part was that I couldn't see the face. So um, it could have grabbed my hip, could have grabbed my stomach. You know, there's other areas that it would have been more severe. Um, and in the future, we then restrained him behind the head. Now, why this, the snake was going to have that sort of reaction regardless. And so, it was either you make it unsafe by him being pissed off and you don't restrain his head and if he bites, he bites, or it's we restrain him and he's pissed off anyway. Um, but that's why it's always important because sometimes when you're walking too with a big snake, if you bump it or if it bumps your leg, um, it might just be pissy and um, at least you can see what is happening so you don't get startled and drop the animal. Um, but yeah, that's the story. And then the kids came and they looked at the stake and they had no idea anything had happened. And then it peed all over the floor. And then when we picked it up to put it back, we restrained it behind the head. And uh, I had to clean all the musk off the glass, the end. But you learn from everything that happens. Um, so this is everything that we covered. Um, when you let go of the head, so when you load a snake back into an enclosure, into like a carrying bin, look at me go, I said one hour, I'm almost done. Um, you could put the back half in first and then release the head. Because if you release the head and everybody's holding on to it, it can turn around. Um, it also helps when I say throwing the head away, I don't mean in the bin, I just mean throwing it away from you. And usually after an encounter like that, when you release the head, the snake will coil back because it just doesn't want anything to do with anything. And so just having a plan for big moves um, is important and they're usually pretty uneventful. Um, in other instances, you can have the snake go where it wants to go for exercise. Um, I had always wished at Fort Worth that we had a public side door so that we didn't have to haul the snake out because in the end, 
him being out for exercise um, didn't necessarily outweigh the experience that he had being taken out for the exercise. So that bottom um, photo is him out. That wasn't the day I got bit, um, but he did pretty good while he was out. Um, lots of smells. They'll sit and smell one spot on the floor for 15 minutes really intensely and their eyes will be forward. So you can see the whites, which you never can. Um, and it was good for him. He got exercise in his enclosure, but the process of removal was so at his size was so hard to acclimate that there was really no way for him to get used to being hauled out um, because it was never a comfortable experience. And so if you can have a way for a snake to exit an enclosure on its own, uh, like the top photo that was at Rob's uh, Wildlife Discovery Center, we let our female come out because the floor had everything raised up so she could go around. She wouldn't get stuck in anything. Um, and you just gave her some time out that way and we didn't have to drag her out um, or have everybody involved in some big event to bring her out for exercise. So smaller snakes, most people are familiar with. Um, uh, if you use boas and pythons for education, um, they're just like other snake species, the way that you distribute their weight. So they might be a little bit more dense um, and they also have a little bit of a different way of holding on. And so some pythons and boas, especially boas, um, since they're climbers, they'll set an anchor. So they'll wrap around usually your arm and not tight. Setting an anchor in snakes is just a comfort thing so that if they fall, which they, they do on their own, um, they don't free fall to the ground. Um, but keeping their body mostly in front of you um, I don't want to say not to put a snake around your neck, like on the right, I'm with an Indian python. I have it over my shoulder, usually over your shoulder and then have the coil under your arm. That's pretty comfortable with a lot of snakes um, because it gives you time. Um, you know your snake, like with our Indians, there was never really anything that upset them. Um, and so there wasn't ever going to be a time where anything super unexpected was going to happen. Um, if it was a snake that I didn't know or it was too big, avoiding putting them on your neck. Um, also putting them on your neck can, the thing that people do a lot of times is they let it hang, which isn't good for their back. So if you have a snake that has an anchor set on your arm, you have it over your shoulder and you have its weight supported, that's good. The thing that I would always avoid, which in zoos, you don't usually ever do this anyway, is passing it to the public or putting it around the public's neck um, because you don't know what they're going to do. People will just throw snakes off of them. Um, they also will, they'll pet it and then they'll be like, oh, wow. And they'll like pinch the skin up like they're pinching fabric and they don't mean to do it, but you don't ever know when people are going to do it. Um, but when it's you, the 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 best thing to do is to make sure the snake's supported uh, both its weight and then if it wants to anchor, um, don't restrain the head moving with the snake. Thankfully with bigger, with like constrictors like this, um, they're pretty slow moving for the most part um, compared to some col uh, colubrids. And so you can kind of get them set into something that's comfortable and they, set, they tend to just kind of sit once they're settled kind of thing. So avoiding uh, handling after feeding, these are all pretty typical snake rules. Um, waking up a snake before you pick it up. Um, if you have a snake that can be kind of pissy in the rack, if you touch them with a tool while you grab their body that can kind of keep them from reacting to your touch, um, they kind of get like, well, I'm being, they're overstimulated for a second before they know it, they're up. And there's sometimes a rough window with certain snakes um, that are learning about being picked up and handled um, that the initial rousing and removing them, they can be kind of iffy. Um, but if you're just like, hey, I'm touching you, whoa, we're in the air. And then they're just kind of like, a, then it's, you miss, you skip a step that they might not like. Um, but it is always kind of good to, Oh, touch the snake first so it knows you're there. As I said, a sleeping snake. Um, 
can't really see. Uh, it sounds really weird, but when you wake them up, they know you're there. Um, they can bite on accident if they're sleeping. Uh, you never really know. It's just like any other animal. Um, and sometimes you want to put the tool again, like when you go to the grabbing, if you put the tool on the side of their neck that's facing you like a block, then you pick them up, use that whole step of not knowing what's going to happen is over, put the tool down and then hold it. Wow. Thanks. When she doesn't get enough attention, she starts doing terrible things. Um, and then these are all keys really that people are familiar with as far as handling snakes in general. There's not too many things about boas and pythons. I'm terrified now the bookshelf's gonna fall on me in front of everybody. Um, boas and pythons have similar behaviors. They're the same shape as other snakes. Um, they don't, they like and don't like to be touched in uh, their faces. Their necks are sensitive, their tails are sensitive. Um, these are all things that are the case um, across the board. Um, some snakes, there's going to be days where they don't want to come out. If a snake strikes at you, probably abandon it. There's really no reason to push it. Um, snakes that are used for education that are that upset that they strike, it's pretty rare. Um, musking and defecating and urinating on you when you pick them up. Um, there is a fine line between not rewarding a snake for behavior um, so that they get used to handling, which goes into learned helplessness, which is a thing. But if they are obviously distressed, um, hopefully you have another snake in the collection that you can use instead. Um, and just keeping in mind during presentations, if any of these things start happening, snake hissing, one thing I've noticed is that. Uh, Big snakes, when they exert themselves during locomotion, like when you're holding them, they'll have heavy, heavy breathing or they'll do like a big sigh. Uh, people will be like, oh, and it's like, no, they're just, honestly, they have one lung. And so they're hauling and it's just a sigh. It's not necessarily, the body language will let you know if it's a hiss. Um, and uh, tail wagging, sometimes when they're irritated, they can grab you with their spurs. It'll be like a pinch. I've only had that happen twice in my life. Um, and it was paired with other uh, irritated behaviors. The snake was done with the interaction. It was overstimulated. Doesn't happen very much, but when it does, um, startling, weird. You forget the claws are there. They don't puncture you. They just kind of pinch you. Um, and then for guests, like we talked about before, um, there's gonna be instances where people are going to do something that you don't expect. And it's usually an adult. Kids are kind of learning how their hands work and pressure. It's kind of like when they teach robots how to hold something without destroying it. That's what a child is like. Everything is just inanimate. And so they'll do whatever they, they want to, to feel it. But I've had adult women in particular, they'll go down and then they'll kind of like do this, but they do it on the skin. And I'm like, oh, they can actually feel that. Um, or they'll pull at scales, all that little stuff, everything that you would normally look out for um, when handling other snakes. That's the same guidelines here. Uh, the frustrated bites, sometimes there's no warning. Um, I had this happen with a Dumeril's boa, um, as well as that the berm, it was very obvious that that, that was um, irritability, but I had a really sweet Dumeril's boa we used for education. And as she got older, um, she was less tolerant of like prolonged handling. Um, I don't know if she got sore because um, they're pretty terrestrial. They don't climb very much. They kind of have like a, a flatter body structure. And um, when snakes age, it's um, this is at least in my experience, you'll have snakes that live a really long time and you'll be like, wow, this snake is so old and looking at it, you wouldn't know. And then like two months later, they have like this deterioration where suddenly they're, they get really tented looking. Um, they just like turn into this old animal rapidly 
Um, it can be really hard to look at a snake and tell its age if it's an if it's adult size. And so she may have been getting sore as she got older, but I had her out at a um, park district event, uh, uh, one of my first jobs, and her head was alongside my arm and she didn't hiss anything. She just turned and she bit the side of my arm and let go. And it wasn't when snakes bite to eat that snout that they'll push their snout into you sometimes. They get it really close and then they'll open to bite. But she did just like a side bite. It was the weirdest signal of like, absolutely not, like we're done. Nobody saw it and I put her away. If people don't see you get bit. Don't bring attention to it. Most people will not even know if the snake is hanging off of you, what is going on? Just always be like, okay, well, the snake's ready to go. Or you could be like, I have to go to the bathroom, everybody, thanks, and put the snake away. And people just don't, they just don't know. But don't blacklist a snake for a random bite because there's so many elements to an in animal encounter that can contribute to a bite that you wouldn't anticipate. And um, that's what happened with that snake is they're like, oh, we can't use her anymore. She's awful. They said, no, she just, there was a lot of kids. It was hot. You know, give them the benefit of the doubt. Always keep the head near you um, because every snake has a boundary. Some snakes will never, ever bite. Some snakes bite once in their life. It doesn't mean that from then on uh, that they cannot be used. Sorry, I went on for that in a while. Personal opinion. Uh, snakes and social media. Um, this is really brief. I just wanted to include it. I, the reptiles do in prehistoric pets, they do a lot of different things that uh, are not necessarily the most professional representation of animal handling. Um, one of my least favorite things that they tend to do is um, one of the first videos I ever saw was Jay in an enclosure with a bunch of retics and uh, they were striking at him and he was in the corner against the wall surrounded by giant snakes. And um, you can always know what you're doing. I would never do that. Um, it's just, it's unnecessary. So it's not, it's, there's certain things about animal care practices that are not wrong or cruel, but they're unnecessary. And I feel like as a field, we need to move towards narrowing the unnecessary things down. So like um, sitting in the enclosure with a big snake when you're cornered, not necessary. Um, handling snakes as shown in these photos, not necessary. Um, in some cases harmful. In some of these, there's only like uh, one point of contact where you have a snake that is probably over 80 pounds um, with all of its weight perched on a shoulder. Um, you might not see any sort of reaction handling a snake that way, but from everything that we've gone over and from what most of you guys know about snake physiology is it's probably not good for their back. It's probably not comfortable if a snake's uncomfortable or if it um, is in pain, it can react strongly. You can get a bite. It's just not necessary. And what a lot of zookeepers know from your time in the field is that you can exhibit animals and present animals to the public in a way that doesn't have any sort of harmful or unnecessary practices. So there's a lot of things that are done with large snakes that are done for wow factor. Seeing a 150 pound snake is a pretty big wow factor without having to handle it incorrectly, without irritating it to the point where it bites, having it strike at you on camera while you're laughing, that kind of stuff, it's unnecessary. It's not a necessary part of animal keeping. And then what happens with everyone else as professionals in the field that work with reptiles, you have people that are coming to you saying, hey, I saw this video on the internet. Um, and Sometimes they'll ask you what you think, but there's a lot of times they'll be like, is that what you guys do? You go in with them and you wrestle them. And like, then you are suddenly having to explain what was wrong with the video they saw and why you didn't, you, we don't do that because you don't have to, people don't give a shit. Sorry, I shouldn't be swearing. I swore twice in this already. 
people are not going to sit there and listen to your super long explanation, but suddenly you do what they see these people doing, which most people don't. Um, and it's just important to remind people that um, while these individuals know a lot about the animals that they work with, um, and they are really passionate about what they do, but not every facility handles animals like this, and this is why, or like this isn't particularly safe, we don't do that with our snakes because it could hurt them. Um, you don't have to be really rude about it because people will think that you, we all kind of do the same thing. This girl works with snakes and so you guys all kind of do the same thing. Um, that there's this across the industry standard, which there, there isn't because there's no regulatory body. Anyway, thanks, I go on that forever. Um, as I mentioned before, um, some snakes will not be suitable for handling. There's some species like anacondas. You don't see them very often in education. Their temperament isn't really, first of all, their temperament's not really conducive with handling and acclimating them to handling and getting bit over and over is not worth it. So you'll have snakes that are suitable, some that are not, and then some that become unsuitable as they grow. And when it gets to the point where it's, the snake is too big for you to handle it comfortably so that you're comfortable and the snake is comfortable on your own. Usually they have to be uh, retired to display or you can move on to what I did with my berms, which was you do a table display where you have the snake all laid out and you are up by the head and most berms are just amazing and they'll sit there and they'll just kind of be interested in what's going on, but they're docile enough that you can have a table presentation with them um, and not have to worry about uh, handling and supporting their body weight while watching out for yourself. Three more slides. Um, so for enrichment, scents are the best stimulation. Uh, snakes' sense of smell is super important to it more than anything else. There's a lot of different ways that you can stimulate them through scent. And these can vary depending on the protocols in your institution. Um, scent trailing without feeding is not cruel for the animal. So if you happen to like do a substrate change, which will be stimulating in itself, if you have a rat that you're feeding something else and you want to trail it over some part of it when you put the snake back in, snakes will be active for quite a while. Um, if there's a scent trail in their enclosure and they'll search. And in the wild, there's gonna be instances where a snake scent trails and it never finds the food. And that's just part of it. So they're gonna be interested in it, whether or not they then get the food at the end. And that's a really good way to stimulate them to be more active in their enclosure um, because they'll go back and they'll check it and they'll see if the scent goes one way or another. Um, having sheds, fur, um, they don't really react to plant-based scents because it's not, doesn't mean anything to them. You can try it, um, but be careful with some like spices that are uh, irritants because it can get in their nares so that it's only like a small amount. Um, new cage furniture, having a mist line. We had a mist line to water our plants, but doing uh, like a mister or a sprinkler, depending on how the enclosure is set up with ventilation. Um, adding new substrate to the enclosure um, that they're not used to, adding uh, tubs for soaking if they don't normally have it, and then any sort of time outside, either outside of their enclosure or outside in the sun. Some snakes become absolute menaces when you put them outside in the sun. It, everything changes. <laughs> um, <laughs> you just have to be careful with that. Make sure like the public's not around. Because when you have them on the ground, that's when your ability to control the animal is a little bit compromised kind of thing. Um, so indicators of good welfare, this is everything that we've talked about. So the condition of the body, uh, their weight, and then all the things that you learn if you've ever read like a reptile um, owner's manual. Well, how to identify a healthy snake. That's always like the first chapter and where to get them. Um, but the appearance of the snake, um, not having nasal discharge, not mouth breathing, um, unless there's respiratory issues, 
or unless they're hissing at you, if they're actively hissing at you through their, the, with the mouth open and their trachea out, if they're pissed, they're doing that on purpose. Um, but if you have a snake that is gaping and then inhaling, uh, wheezing, gurgling, sometimes snakes will spit. They will spit loogies from their trachea. Um, they have to, they have to clear it. So they will cough. Um, sometimes they'll cough and their entire body will jump, but a cough or a sneeze um, does not necessarily mean that they're ill. Uh, they just have to clear their windpipe and uh, just clean, mostly shedding in one piece. I've worked with snakes that half the time they literally were not awake for when their shed cycle was like at the best point because they're outer, the outer, the old skin is like moistened. And that's the best time for them to shed. I'd have snakes that would sleep through it. They would just sleep through it. They'd wake up, the shed skins dry on them. And um, then they had to be soaked. And so it's not always bad if they don't shed in one piece, but um, it's usually best if it does because they'll also, you'll have snakes that'll just shed their face because it's uncomfortable and then they just stop. So there's different reasons for that. Um, behavioral indicators being active to a certain extent, um, thermoregulating through locating around their enclosure, closer, moving closer to basking areas or warmer areas, moving to pools or the cooler side, um, depending on what they need, being curious about items in their enclosure, interacting with new items, um, responding to staff. So you, when you go in with a big snake and they wake up, they'll usually watch you. Um, if there's a snake that's not really responsive in any way, even when it's touched, it's usually an indicator that there's an issue. Um, but in general, they have similar activity patterns to, to other snakes besides when they're digesting large prey. And a lot of big snakes, because at a certain point you can't handle them anymore, um, they can become aggressive and uh, they can have hair trigger and um, be a hassle sometimes, but I always thought that large snakes um, with bad attitudes were fun to work around um, because they were alert, they're engaged, they react to you. Um, as long as you have enough space to work with them, I always found it um, very rewarding. So thanks, wow, I lied. I lied to everyone here. Sorry, it was two hours. Uh, there might not be anybody left, which I can't see anything on here uh, without closing anything. Come on now, there we go. Oh my goodness. Wow, thanks for sticking it out. Um, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm looking through, the, I was looking through the slides this morning and I was like, oh, this will be no problem. I'll just blow through it. Um, but I was lying. Um, but there we go. That was everything. Um, so I apologize. Okay, let's see. Recommendations for height. Um, I can recommend some size requirements, but as we talked about with height, it's usually about maneuverability um, for staff in the enclosure and then uh, uh, height for climbing uh, cage furniture for climbing. And, um, so it's, it's usually you want to be safe working in the enclosure and then the height is kind of up to you, um, how high you want it to go. And then you have to be careful too. If you have a uh, high perching, you don't, you want to avoid being face level with a snake on perching as well, so that you don't get struck on the face ever. Um, I've worked in enclosures where there was the Amazon tree boas, so they're much smaller, but they would always sit around the door and we had six of them and they were so nasty. So you'd open the door and there would just be a bunch of little heads and you had like this much space and you're like, okay, face first. So that type of stuff you have to keep in mind as well. Um, yeah, so with large snakes, the, the, there's an ambient base temperature that has to be maintained. And if you don't say that, 
then people will set it as room temperature. I've noticed that the people will just in their brain, this happens more in pet ownership, I guess I should say, but um, people don't really take it into consideration that uh, a snake's ambient temperature, unless it's a native snake, is usually gonna be higher than what we're used to. But having a big enclosure, and that's what makes keeping like big berms in enclosures at home so difficult is because if you have a hot and a cool side, it's only by a few degrees either way. And if you have to house a snake in an enclosure without a gradient, then you usually choose a middle ground. Um, you don't want it too hot or too cool kind of thing. And no, um, ceramic heat emitters are, are pretty bad unless you have a, a, an enclosure uh, like a vision cage that contains heat well. It doesn't radiate heat very far down. I already answered the question about substrate. Um, stubborn snake that doesn't want to come off live food, it can be really difficult. Uh, sometimes if you start a snake off with live prey, um, like if you fed a snake two food items, you can... Um, do the live prey, the snake will constrict it, eat it. And then you offer the second prey item as pre-killed um, and engage it in the same way. They're already gonna be stimulated. Once the snake starts eating, it's gonna, it'll continue to take food items from you usually like in that sitting. Um, and at that point, then they get used to the difference. They'll be engaged in eating, um, but the prey will move differently. It'll have a different texture. Obviously, the like um, the muscle tone of frozen thawed prey is a lot different than a live mouse, um, but that can be done. You can also scent, uh, if you have a live feeder that's live feeding on rodents, feeding on live rodents. If you offer pre-killed prey like chicks, um, they might show interest in pre-killed prey because it's a bird uh, and that you can get them on that, then you can send them to rodents. It really depends on the snake. Um, I don't even know if they're here anymore. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for staying. For an ambassador red tail boa, what would you recommend for substrate enclosure design? Um, a lot of times the best thing that you can do for a snake, like red tails that are kind of in the middle um, as far as like size goes, is building, building the enclosure yourself. Um, and when you do that, um, if it's an ambassador animal that's off exhibit and you don't need to have it be some perfectly constructed uh, cage, there's a lot of really good Facebook groups for private owners that build their own enclosures and they'll, they'll build them kind of with acrylic you sometimes with a wood base, um, well, I would assume with a wood base, I am not construction savvy, so I would not be able to recommend, but uh, we had a really nice hand-built red tail boa enclosure when I worked at the Reptarium in Plainfield, Texas, and it was like an octagon shape, and so it had floor space, and then we had a tub in the center that had a, a PVC drain so that um, we could you could either run a hose to the drain. Um, it didn't look great, uh, but it had the ability for the pool. It had the um, land area. And then we also did, um, you can do natural perching like logs. So a lot of it was uh, big perching uh, for arboreal activity. And then we had a sealed um, plank platform under the basking area. So the octagon shape provided more, more perimeter and floor space than like the traditional square. Cause when you have arboreal square, it has like a small, like a small footprint, you know what I mean? Um, but I would highly recommend uh, looking at some of those enclosures um, that people have built. The supplies are not inexpensive well they might be now I don't know wood's expensive um, but it's it's going to be way cheaper than buying a 
uh, those custom giant like animal plastics are like thousands of dollars for something that you could possibly build. And then for substrate, if you usually use um, different types of mulch with boas, it's not as big of a deal. What I found that helps with humidity the best is having um, a lot of live plants in the enclosure. And if you have a lot of perching for red tails to use, they won't really crush your plants as much. Um, so if you give them a sturdy perch and they're not gonna try to climb on like your palms. So any type of um, like the eco earth coconut husk mixed with mulch, um, topsoil and sand. For some reason I love and adding sand. I don't know why. <laughs> it gives it more hold, but it doesn't really matter in this situation. Um, but uh, yeah, you have a lot of options if it's off if it's off exhibit. And then you can also, um, corners cages, you can modify those as well. So the corners cages that are um, kind of like the aviary installations with the aluminum frame. If you install plexiglass on those um, to hold humidity, those work well because the frame um, doesn't, it, since it's not wood, it won't get all nasty from excessive humidity. You'd have to modify it quite a bit to make it suitable for a snake, um, but it might be longer lasting than aluminum or uh, than the wood framing. But uh, there's a lot of people that make really nice handmade cages that are willing to share their secrets as well if you want a construction project, which not everybody wants. Thanks for coming. Sorry, I'm disgusting. <laughs> I was glad I didn't start coughing. Um, I appreciate everybody's time. This is enough for tonight. Thanks for listening. Um, of course, thank you so much. Yes, the cat will give me sleep. She's, <laughs> she, had her, she had her terror run and now she's finished. All right, everybody have a good night. Thank you.